I even started to grow a beard in honor of this Viking video because I wanted to really drive home the point and really just kind of get you in the environment. Why did the Vikings have such a powerful diet? Even though they didn't live that long, if you look at a picture of a Viking, you hardly would ever see an overweight Viking. They were never depicted as unhealthy people or obese people. They were always fit, they were always pretty lean, and they always looked strong, right? Well, was it just their genetics or did their diet play a part? Well, if you look at them, you realize historically their diet was actually what we would consider to be relatively optimal as an omnivorous diet today. And we're gonna break down what makes it unique and maybe you can adopt some of the principles and maybe you can start to be a Viking. Now, full disclaimer, Vikings didn't live very long, but we also have to be real. They didn't have emergency medical care, they didn't have surgeries, they didn't have the medicine we have today. Like, despite our metabolic health and how poor it is in the world right now, people are still living longer. So lifespan isn't always like a fair thing to shake out and say like, oh, well, they're living longer. Okay, there's a lot of reasons for all-cause mortality. And just because someone lives long or lives short doesn't mean that they weren't or were metabolically healthy. What the Vikings were known for when you look historically at their diet was balance. That's what's kind of interesting. Compared to today, as much as we might like to think we're balanced because the label on our cereal box says it's part of a balanced diet, it's not balanced. Okay, they were very balanced out, and we'll talk about the proper ratios and where they landed in just a second. But really, their diet was focused on protein. Protein was the foundation of what they would eat. What's kind of interesting is if you look at like the French and the English and either other parts of Europe during the same time frame, their body composition, how they were depicted, is completely different. And their diets were starting to transform into more refined and milled grains, and they were very, very carbocentric. Whereas you look at the Vikings, they were fish and game and root vegetables, and they were much more protein-centric, which is exactly what we're really trying to aim for today. No one's demonizing carbs anymore, but we are saying, hey, the emphasis might need to be on protein. So it's estimated that the Vikings consumed 35% protein, and about 35% fat, and about 30% carbohydrates. That's a pretty darn good ratio. In fact, 35% protein is what I would consider like an ideal amount for the average person, maybe a little more if you're training hard. What are we consuming roughly today? In the US, it's nowhere near that. Now we'll focus on each individual macronutrient. We'll focus on proteins, their carbs, their fats a little bit. But one of the things that's kind of interesting to highlight right out the gate is the carbohydrate that they would consume, even if they did consume grains, they were consuming predominantly barley because barley could grow in really cold temperatures. There were regions of Denmark that started to produce wheat later in the Viking era, but even then, they would typically make it into like a porridge where it was still like the whole grain. So you're getting a lot more out of it than you would if it was say milled or whatnot. Then as far as the protein is concerned, you could probably imagine Vikings eating a lot of fish and typically they were eating river and stream fish, not necessarily the ocean fish that we might consider when we think about them, you know, on their boats in the middle of the ocean. So a lot of fresh water fish, but also Northern Europe is extremely, or at least was, extremely dense forest. So there's a lot of wild game, okay? A lot of pig, a lot of boar, a lot of deer, all of that. And that was a huge part of their diet, which we'll talk about more as well. Their fatty acid intake was also quite good considering the fish that they would consume. And then of course their vegetable intake and their carbohydrate intake was predominantly root vegetables because they could be grown in colder temperatures. So again, we'll break this all down. Let's focus on the protein part first and then we'll kind of categorize different areas. So their protein intake, again, being predominantly wild game, really lended them a big hand. Now they were also very good at domesticating animals as well. So they had a good amount of cows and chickens. If you look historically and you know, for what it's worth, I'm half Italian and half Danish pretty much. So I've looked a lot into Viking culture in the past because it's always been kind of interesting to me because it's somewhat my heritage. But if you look at the history books, like they were very good at domesticating animals. So there was a lot of meat intake from their wild game, but also from what they had domesticated in the way of cows and chickens and whatnot. What's interesting is there's a study that was published in the Proceedings of the Latvian Academy of Sciences, so like up there in the Baltic region anyway, and it looked at wild game meat nutrition compared to domestic game or domestic animal nutrition. It was pretty interesting because ultimately what they found is that 
protein contents were higher in wild game. Essential amino acid contents were higher in wild game, meaning the protein quality was likely better. And the essential fatty acid content, meaning the fats that we truly need for survival, were higher in wild game. Not to mention the omega-3 profiles better. So more omega-3s, less omega-6s, and even lower saturated fat, even though the fat amounts were about the same. So although the total grams of fat were about the same, the fat quality was significantly better in the wild game. Now, forget about all the little particulars. They were probably getting good micronutrition from there, but the bottom line is that they were eating a lot of it. And now when we look at the longevity literature, we're starting to see that protein is one of the most critical things that we need in our diet when it comes down to longevity. So from a metabolic longevity perspective, the Vikings were probably quite healthy. But one thing we have to consider is because their protein intake was higher, naturally their carbohydrate intake was a little bit lower. So we're gonna cover that in just a second as well. But they also consumed a lot of this fish, right? And when you look at fish consumption in general, you're typically looking at a high quality protein, you're looking at a decent fatty acid profile, but it's not the same as the fish that we have today. Okay, the wild caught fish that they would get out of lakes and rivers and streams, and occasionally out of the ocean, cold water fish in general, they were a pretty high omega-3 content, but also it's estimated that there are three to four times as much calcium and iron in wild caught fish than there are in farmed fish today. Not to mention that farmed fish have two to four times as much fat in them because they're essentially adding weight to them and it's not the same thing. There's a study published in Frontiers in Cellular and Infection Metabolism and I'm gonna read an excerpt from this study that outlined the risks of antibiotics in farm-raised fish today. Here's what it says. Although the antibiotic residues in fish are at trace level concentrations, long-term exposure may raise various human health concerns, including enhanced antibiotic resistance, changes in metabolism, and composition changes of the microbiota. What's most alarming is that it can actually change our metabolism. So if you try to be a Viking, so you go down to your local Piggly Wiggly and you end up getting some farmed fish there, you're probably going the opposite direction. So what I would recommend is things like sardines and mackerel, things you might get in cans that are gonna be a little bit more basic like that. I also recommend shellfish whenever you can. I also recommend wild game meat, okay? There are companies that actually, you can get it at the grocery store. The next best thing is probably gonna be like ground bison. I put a link down below if you wanna try Butcher Box because it's a place for everyone to be able to get like ground bison. They have ground beef, ground bison, it's all grass fed, grass finished. I'm not gonna to lie to you and tell you that it's the same as going out and you know, getting a deer from Northern Europe forest, but it's really good quality meat and it tastes really darn good. They've been a sponsor on this channel for a super long time. So yes, this is a plug for them. But if you're watching this video, you probably eat meat and you might wanna give them a try. So that link down below is a special link so that you can try ButcherBox, get grass-fed, grass-finished meat delivered to your doorstep. They also have fish, they have cod, they have scallops, they have salmon, you name it. Not to mention pork, chicken, all kinds of different cuts of beef. Grass-fed, grass-finished, some of the best tasting stuff that you'll find. So check that link out down below. Again, that is a special link. It's in the top line of the description underneath this video. They fermented meat. This is what's interesting. The Viking people were ahead of their time in terms of the quote-unquote technology that they used to ferment meat. Okay, they are pretty notorious for a couple of dishes. One of them is like a fermented shark and a fermented herring. How they supposedly did that back in the day was they would dig a hole essentially like in a riverbed or on the shore and they would put the fish in there and they would put sand and then they would put rocks and they would push down on the rocks and squeeze the juices and the liquid out of the meat and then they would ferment it from there. Kind of interesting that they understood this technology, that if they got rid of the juices in there, they could ferment this better. Well, now we're starting to see all this evidence pointing towards fermented meat as being exceptionally healthy. What was most interesting is that this made it so that the Vikings could continue to eat even their game meat during the winter months when it was really cold, when hunting might've been more difficult. So where other cultures may have just gone into foraging or a different mode, like they were able to preserve and they probably did this with vegetables, not just meats. So they really found a way to maintain their balance year round, which is a little more like what we do here year round, where we're not eating as much seasonally, we're able to actually have preserved foods. 
Now the part that I find the most interesting. I am not a huge carbohydrate consumer. I was very low carb for a long time, I still am. But when I do consume carbs, they're usually pretty low glycemic. And eh, well, unbeknownst to me, I'd been kind of eating a Viking diet for a very long time. So a Viking is almost taking the Mediterranean diet and elevating it a little bit more to even lower glycemic. So lots of root vegetables. So we're talking onions, we're talking leeks, we're talking carrots, we're talking parsnips. If you wanted to expand maybe outside of just the typical like Viking area, root vegetables also include like sweet potatoes, things like that, which are hugely beneficial. America in general, our fruit and vegetable intake is down about 10% since 2004, and our vegetable intake alone is down 16%. And that's actually from 2004 to 2020, chances are it's gotten even worse now. So we don't consume that much, whereas when you look at their intake, because they were consuming root vegetables, they weren't necessarily dependent on like a crop cycle. They were able to have these things and they would keep for a long time too. So not only were they getting their carotenoids, their vitamin A and things like that, but they were also getting a unique amount of carbohydrates in a low glycemic form from these root vegetables. So they were getting bulk and volume without having super high glycemic starches. Now they did consume fruits. That was definitely a part of their diet, but you can imagine in a cold climate, things would change. So there are a lot of apples and a lot of cherries, which are notorious for being very beneficial fruits as well. And also relatively low glycemic once again. And let's talk barley for just a second because the one grain that could grow where it was cold was barley, which is notorious for being low glycemic. Not to mention it contains a ton of beta-glucans, which are one of the most researched fibers in the world of grains. And it is arguably what makes barley the most superior grain that is out there. Check out some of this literature too to back it up. This was in European Journal Nutrition. It took a look at varying forms of wheat to barley with varying levels of beta-glucans. Wheat having the lowest levels of beta-glucans, barley having up to 10 grams of beta-glucans, these specific fibers. Okay, they measured their glucose at 0, 30, 60, 120, and 180 minutes. Okay, they wanted to see how it would respond. Lo and behold, the higher the beta-glucans, the more barley and less wheat, the lower the blood sugar response flat out a lower glycemic carbohydrate that controlled blood sugar. In a world with people that were very fit and moving around a lot like the Vikings, this could be huge. But there's another study that reinforced this even more, where it actually found that when you consumed more in the way of barley, there was a 30% increase in glucose uptake, meaning the glucose that was consumed was actually used better and soaked up where it needed to go, and subsequently a 29% decrease in blood sugar. So more glucose getting into the muscles where it needs to go, less floating around in the bloodstream, contributing to metabolic issues and fatigue and malaise. To top it all off, they used a lot of these herbs that I've talked about before. One thing they didn't do is they didn't use spices a lot. There weren't a lot of like curcumin and spices. That didn't really come in until later, right? So these hot spices. But they used a lot of these sort of Mediterranean spices. A lot of rosemary, a lot of sage, a lot of thyme a lot of coriander. What's interesting about these is these are also very antimicrobial, especially thyme. Like this has been known for a long time to be very antibacterial. Now, when you look at like coriander, super high in vitamin K, and it's interesting because vitamin K helps vitamin D get into the right places. In a region that was probably outside a lot but didn't get as much vitamin D given how north they were, it's interesting that their vitamin K levels would be higher to help facilitate the uptake of the vitamin D a little bit better. It's kind of funny how things naturally sort of fall into place. How can you start to add Viking principles into your diet without growing a beard and getting a boat? I think the best way that you could probably start doing this is follow their macronutrient ratios. The 35% protein, the 35% fat coming from omega-3s and coming from healthy fat sources, and 30% carbohydrates coming from root vegetables. But even if you didn't eat root vegetables, even if you didn't follow this diet specifically, you could say, hey, if I follow these macronutrient ratios, and if I make protein the foundation, and I prioritize the lean cuts of meat when I can, and I just eat everything that I really can as far as the good quality protein is concerned, things will also fall into place. But I think the most important carbohydrate piece to take away from here is lean into the root veggies. You're making a rice dish at home, like with some stir fry and stuff like that. You could do the weird thing that I do, which really isn't all that weird. Maybe my family's making stir fry and they're putting it over a bed of rice. We, I still have the stir fry with them, but you know what I do? I cook up a sweet potato real quick and I cube it really small. 
And yes, I'll even use the microwave, unlike a Viking, very unviking thing to do. I'll look, take a paper towel, wrap the sweet potato up, put it in the microwave for four minutes, and then cut it up into small cubes, and I'll use that as my base. I am a huge root vegetable fan, and I always have been. And this is a way for me to get my Viking on without being a stinky weirdo. I'll see you tomorrow.